Whiskey Jason here. Whiskey from the viewpoint of an American over here in Germany. I should have been in Ireland last week, and instead I'm doing a virtual tour of the distilleries I would have visited instead. Today I have the privilege of talking together with... David Stapleton from the Connacht Whiskey Company. All right, very, very good. You are on my list of places to visit. Um, actually, we should have done this last week, but last week was a car crash, as you said. It was just terrible. And then uh, this week, we have a little bit more time to talk to each other. So this is great that I can actually get to meet you virtually. Thank you very much for this. My pleasure. All right. Tell us, first of all, who you are in this company and um, maybe how did you get interested in whiskey way back when? Right. Well, I'm David Stapleton and I am the founder of the one of the founders of the Connacht Whiskey Company. How did I get into whiskey? Well, I mean, it probably stems all the way back to my university days. So that was the time that we managed to get away from home and experiment a little bit. Um, and along the way, I've had a, a very varied career. I'm a manufacturing engineer, not specifically in the drinks industry, but in pharmaceuticals and microelectronics. But, but I have worked across the world from Asia to the States, to Central Europe, to Eastern Europe. Um, and all along the way, you get the opportunity to try new things. I suppose from my perspective, um, beer might be a part of my, my enjoy, always complimented. But what I found is even, even as I travel the web, so, you know, along the way, you, you're taste buds start to kind of find subtleties and flavor profiles that you like. Um, so that allowed me to be able to pivot into to certain whiskey styles. I've always kind of gravitated back to, and I suppose, how did I get into the industry? Um, in 2012, ultimately, you know, Cooley was acquired by Beams on Tory. Um, and at that particular point in time, pretty much all the large distilleries in Ireland were became owned now by international um, organizations. So, so ultimately, what was Irish whiskey's distilling identity in, in a purely Irish context? Now, that isn't to say that what people are doing in IDL or what are people are doing in Bushmills isn't Irish. But I had a sense of, you know, well, what was it and what was it for me? Now, I live in the west of Ireland in the county of Mayo, which is right along the Wild Atlantic Way, which I'm sure everybody knows of. Um, but the art of distilling had been lost to that particular area for 150 years. So when you bring all of the pieces together for me, it became like a little bit of a puzzle. And, and I became, I'm intrigued by puzzles. Um, so we looked at this, well, I looked at this and said, okay, well, if one were to do it, and if I like a style, could I replicate the style or create a style that might be very passionate to me? And I suppose that journey started in 2013 and we're now in 2020. So it's been a kind of a voyage of love, passion, of discovery, of mistakes and recovering and learning from those particular mistakes to, to basically what we have right over my shoulder here, which is a fully active distillery. And the highlight of, of our journey so far is that our first distillery as of last year there'll be four years this year and all of the efforts of the last number of years will be come later come will, will will literally come to the point where our flagship will be released um towards quarter four of this year assuming that the covid virus doesn't start to continue to throw a spanner in the works all right very good i want to greet some of the people that are actually watching and commenting already tina from germany yeah. thomas over here from germany also here from Germany, Alicia, I don't think she's German, and Eric says here, hi from Belgium. So just you Morning, mentioned everybody. All, um, where you're at, and I'd like to show this on the map. I've been doing this a lot because Ireland is not the place that everyone knows where everything is. No. So down here in Dublin and up here, your Connacht Whiskey Company. For me, one of the reasons yeah. I have not visited you so far on my trip was you're, you're kind of far out of the way of normal tourist destinations. Let's say that. We are we are very far out of it. We are, I, I think we're almost Ireland's best kept secret. I think ourselves in Schlieve League um, yeah. are, are very remote. You know, I think James made the point in his interview recently is that if you kind of draw a line across the centre of the country from Dublin over to Galway, you know, 95% of the activity is to the south of that line. And there are very few distilleries, particularly in the Republic, north of that line. 
All right. Very, very good. Now, I'm sorry if the connection from David sometimes isn't great. You're, I think you're using your Wi-Fi and every once in yeah. a while your voice is a little bit jumbled, but we'll work through this. And that's very, okay. very good. Now, um, tell us why was the Connect Distillery built there in Mayo? Why that area? Well, I suppose I live in the county, which is is the first thing. So it makes my commute relatively easy every day. So that's always a positive thing, right? Um, I, secondly, um, the, we, we've, the, the company is called the Connacht Whiskey Company. So Connacht being the region of five counties that's on that Western Peninsula. Um, ultimately, in order to find a location that was really you know, I, I thought it was going to be our anchor, our brand home. It's going to be somewhere where we're not going to up sticks and leave this anytime soon. There was a very long selection process to find a site that would be suitable. Um, in 2014, I came across this particular premises. And what really intrigued me is that this was a former bakery. So you have this beautiful, almost like a legacy, the use of grain to create bread versus the use of grain to be able to create whiskey. And I completely loved that journey. Uh, I think secondly, the facility is 27,000 square feet. So it's about you know, our 2,700 square meters. So it's fit for purpose for our size. And then more importantly, we have the beautiful River Moy, which is right adjacent to us, which is one of the premier salmon fishing rivers in the world. Um, which is, yeah, I could throw a stone in it for my office. And we're one kilometer from, from the Atlantic Ocean. So we have this beautiful, rugged, natural environment. We have this beautiful maritime climate that I just felt was going to always be really, and a great building and a great story. It just, it became a natural, it was an easy selection to choose here. Very, very good. Now, did you do this all by yourself or did you have a team that started this distillery? Now, it's almost yeah. four years ago, I think, yeah, when construction um, started. So we started, so I acquired the building at the beginning, pretty much on the 3rd of January, 2014. Okay. Now, it was an old, it was an old building. So we, we pretty much had 12 months of a build out in effect to, to modernize it, to, to literally, you know, from IT to drainage systems, to the, the orientation of the building, to new offices, to all sorts of stuff. So it took us a year to, to build it out. The equipment then came towards the back end of that year. And as you know, there's a fairly significant commissioning and installation phase. Everything has to be connected. Every, you know, we have to make sure that everything is tested before we're allowed and on, under basically regulations to start our, distill, our distillation process. So we started, we had a, a soft opening in October, 2015. We basically had a, our, our first distillations then happened well, there were more boils at the beginning of 2016 and our first distillations happened in 20 are, are, are in, in in the middle of 2016. I don't do this by myself. So the, the company started with a an American cousin of mine, PJ. Um, and so PJ lives in Pennsylvania. Um, and he too area, right? Philadelphia is spot on, Jason. Yeah. So um so PJ basically was the chairman of the Philadelphia or the, the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board for a long number of years, he was also the chairman of NAPCA, which is the Association of Control States. So unbeknownst to me, he was talking to the board people stateside and I was, you know, making, I was thinking about this on the Irish side. We came together summer holidays in the west of Ireland, played some golf, shot the breeze, talk, spoke about things and there was a kind of a natural gravitas to whiskey. Um, so that was the, the formation of it. Um, so I have two other partners, or three other partners actually, um, that are involved in the business, um, Tom Jensen, Rob Castle, and John Romanelli. Um, and, and each of those, um, some have spirits sector experience, others don't, but we've come together as a unit to try and you know develop this. So we've come a long way. All right, very, very good. What many people don't know is that some control states in the United States means that there are not individual companies, but rather the state buys the alcohol. So Pennsylvania is one of the largest purchasers of alcohol in the world. And so anything sold in Pennsylvania is sold through the state of Pennsylvania. And one single authority buys everything that's there, set the prices, and also buys the stock that they need. And so there's a, a lot of purchasing power there, um, actually more than maybe um, some other thing like um, 
other companies in Florida or Texas or other places. Very, very good. Yeah, now, hmm? Pennsylvania purchases about $2.2 billion worth of spirits every year. So that gives you a sense of scale. So it, it's a very large customer. Yeah, very, very good. Now, going back to Ireland now, let's go through the entire process. Where do you source your grains from? So I'm not sure. The territory of Mayo is it's not conducive to buy or, or to, to growing malt barley to begin with. So, so we have a lot on the primary agriculture would be um, livestock production. So um, beef, sheep, dairy, those particular things. So, so trying to develop um, a, you know, a, rep or a sustainable source of barley out of uh, Mayo and even Connacht at large is a difficult thing to do. So what we do is we buy all of our grain comes from um, Hookhead in County Wexford. So if you if you revert back to the map, it's literally down in the bottom right hand corner of the country. Okay. So there's a very small so there's a very small peninsula there with ten farmers um, that we source all of our um, grain from. Um, that barley is then sent to Minch Malt in Kildare, where they malt that for us, um, and then you know we use that in our in our manufacturing process. Now we don't we, we malt the barley not to distiller malt specification, but more to an ale malt specification. So what that means is that there's a slightly higher moisture content in the barley when it comes to us. And what, and, and what we feel is that that just gives us some additional flavor notes that we want in our whiskey. So it's slightly different. We've kind of deviated off, off, off the main path that most of the distillers would have um, across the country. I, I, you know, if, if you want to kind of look at somebody um, that might be a little bit, you know, comparative to us, um, Mark Rainier would obviously have a very strong terroir proposition. We're not in Mark's league, but certainly we've t we've put the same effort into sourcing grain. And I, I would say that Clonakilty would also be in that um, that same vein, where Michael has his barley fields are adjacent to um, the the peninsula where he has his his um, maritime warehouse. So there there's a couple of us that have pursued that particular path independently, you know, in different time frames. But it's something where we feel there's a it's terrific growing conditions. It has a lovely maritime climate. Um, it's a nice sustainable proposition, and more importantly, you know, it's 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 inherently Irish at the end of the day. Excellent. So, that we, so, so that's where we source the grain. Um, when it comes to us, um, we everything that we do is under our roof. So we have a roller mill here, and we have a brewing system that we purchased from um, Rolex in Germany. So that has a mash ton, lauter ton system. So in the context of the lauter ton, as you know, is basically to um, yeah to separate the wort from the grain. Um, Fermentation, you can see some of the fermentation tanks right behind me. Um, so we, what we have is we have a half ton mash, uh, mash kettle. So we're not a whiskey factory, but ultimately we're a boutique craft distillery. We're not going to be making, when somebody says thousands of barrels, that kind of, that to me is large scale stuff. We do, we will probably, we produce on a double shift basis about 150,000 LPA per year. So you're not talking about hundreds of thousands of barrels. We're, 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 we're in the thousand, slightly more than a thousand barrel capacity on a double shift basis. We have three stills. I'm not sure you have, you have the spirit still over your right shoulder. <laughs> and then I have the intermediate still and the spirit still. <laughs> There you go. So spirit, spirit still yeah, on, jo on, on Jason's right. The intermediate state was still right behind his head. And the spirit still is to the left-hand side or, or, or my right-hand side. <laughs> and, and so what we have is everything that we do here is single malt. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we have is we have a we have two skews of our single malt. So we have a double distilled single malt, which will be released this year. And then we have a triple distilled single malt. Now, what we do is specific to our distillation practice practices, you know, we obviously know that there's a process of adding back um, 
basically heads and tails, four shots and feints into the prior distillation. We've, we've taken a slightly different approach on the management of the four shots and feints. I would say if I were to look at somebody that, that probably is in that space, Springbank in Scotland would probably be in that space. And that allows us to be able to manage flavor because ultimately we're trying to create a flavor profile kind of unique to, unique to us. Uh, and, and you know how do we do that? in keeping with the Irish whiskey technical file. So we want to follow you know, the, the, the rules specific to the technical file in terms of the, the production of Irish whiskey. But within that, we see some innovations that are available to us to, 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 to do something in a slightly different and unique way. So that's our distillation. Then we have our, our aging warehouse is all on site. So we store all our barrels on site. We have a bottling, all of our bottling is done inside also. So basically everything is done under one roof from the minute the grain is received until a, a barrel of whiskey is disgorged and a bottle of product is, is finished. All done here. Excellent, excellent. Now you took a little bit of a different route. You actually did not create the Connacht brand, first of all, but you rather went to the, the uh, spade and bush life thing. What made yeah, well, you... That. Well, what we wanted to do, and again, it's 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 all about disclosure and and being honest with the consumer. So our spade and bushel product it is th these are sourced sourced whiskies, so they are a product of the company rather than fundamentally being produced by the company. And we've always wanted to be very clear with that to to our consumers. So the Connacht brand will be held exclusively for our flagship our own whiskey that will be released this year, and that will take a life of its own in terms of, of its releases and its, its um, you know, the, the stock skews and then the limited releases that would follow. But we also wanted to honor the fact that we've come across some really exceptional whiskies that we wanted to be able to make available. So we carved out Spade and Bushel as a root and a brand with which we could do that. So while they're not from us or distilled by us, we truly love them. And what we've done is we've, you know, we've tried to affect the distillate through either a cask finish process or in some particular aging style that we would have here based on the warehouse being adjacent to the, 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 the Atlantic Ocean to create something that we, we can stand over and it helps us in the context of our credibility to, to our consumers. Obviously, our whiskey, it takes four years for our whiskey to come out as a minimum itself. So we want something along the way where we build both brand credibility and producer credibility along the way. All right, very, very good. The first bottle that I would like to show, and you can show it as well, would be our Ballyhoo Irish Whiskey, which was a very unique thing. I always wanted to make a cocktail with it with cranberry sauce, uh, cranberry juice. I don't know why, but it was very, very nice, and the bottle itself is also magnificent looking. Was it created extra just for the bartender scene? Well, this this is it here. So yeah, if people can see. I need to go that way, right? So so this is Ballyhoo. Bally, Bally yeah, there we go. We got it. So so what it is? This is a, this is a very easy drinker. This is a single. This is a single grain um, style Irish whiskey, um, and and ultimately what we want to do is we want to bring people maybe novices to the Irish whiskey scene to be able to, to be able to step into it without it being, you know, overly complicated, overly robust, you know, you, where you can taste it, you can savor it without it, you know, having that blowing the mouth off you type scenario where you can get with some very strong, robust whiskeys that are, you, it just takes a while. You have to gravitate in there. You have to, you know, you have to grow the palate to be able to understand the flavor. So, so Ballyhoo for us is really, it's that stepping stone into, you know, craft whiskeys per se. It's a port finish. So the port is a tawny port from the Douro region. And, and ultimately, what does it do? You know, it allows, it's, it's fully 100% finished in port so all of the distillate goes into port for a minimum of six months and that it gives it a it, it complements the the light grain style with kind of tones of berry vanilla maple syrup and it's just it's a really really good starter whiskey at a good at a good price point also so like you said it's very versatile jason you can use it for anything so you can use it neat you can add it with a little bit of a mixer you can create a cocktail with it so whatever style that you like to take your whiskey with, Ballyhoo will fit. 
Very good. The next bottle that I thought was very unique was your Brothership Blended Whiskey. Now, it's not Irish, it's not American, but yet it's a combination of both. Whose idea was that? I mean, that was crazy interesting. Well, the, the, so this is Brothership, right? Again, we need to go that way. So so th this was kind of, I, I, I suppose, how did it happen? The company is a, is a you know, it's, it has an Irish aspect to it, but it also has a strongly U.S. aspect to it. So this was almost like a, a marriage between the Irish side and the U.S. side coming together to create something that was slightly novel and unique to us. U ultimately, there was a ship that was called the Brother that brought Irish immigrants from the west of Ireland all the way into Philadelphia, back in the 19th century, around the famous famine times. The cues of it, the label is like a postage stamp. So that's writing home from the US to Ireland and or from Ireland to the US. So, so this was just a really novel way to release something to the market that was really within the DNA of the company, how it came together, the journeys of our forefathers in the past and all of that sort of stuff. So, so really that was the purpose of it, not to create a unique style or, or give a category bender and we got into trouble with the, with, with the Department of Agriculture saying that we were breaching the, the technical file and we were doing all sorts of things. No, it's just a very nice blended whiskey. It's a 10 year old, American light whiskey, and we tried to blend with lots of different styles of American whiskies that would complement a 10 year old single malt. So that if we, so we tried to mix it, blend it with a little bit of rye, the rye became too spicy and it spoiled the, the sweetness of the Irish. So the light whiskey just became a very nice complementary aspect to the Irish whiskey. So it's slightly more Irish than American, but it comes together in, in a really nice sipping whiskey. All right, very good. The next bottle that I actually also liked um, was the couple of batches was your spade and bushel here, 10 year old single malt cast yeah. strength. And even yeah. some people wrote here in the comments, um, it, it's, as a, it's a beauty and um, unfortunately it's discontinued. That was just some yeah. stock you had back then, wasn't it? So, so what we did was that we, we bought some stock um, from a source, I'm not allowed to say the source, um, back in 2015. So we literally, so we've had that particular whiskey in our warehouse from 2015. And what we did was we did a limited number of, we did, I think it was 5,000 bottles of the 10 year old cask strength as a first release. Now what that has been, that has grown into a, I don't know if you have that one, I'm just gonna bring it up here. So the next version of that is, if you can see it, the next bottling of that is a spade and bushel 12 year old. Now what we did was we've, you can see that it's a double barrel um, release. So we basically took the distillate, the 10 year old distillate, put it back into fresh um, first fill bourbon barrels to be able to enhance the distillate, to give it more, you know, to complement the vanilla, the butterscotch, the toffee tones with it. So it's still the, the same fantastic whiskey with a kind of a, a refreshed version of it to complement those lovely flavor tones. We also have some of that whiskey that's in Marsala barrels. So that's a 14 year old whiskey now that we will look to really Early next year as a 15 year old whiskey. So as I was saying to you at the very outset, we've tried to effect change with the distillates that we have, recognizing that they are fantastic whiskies, but trying to add a little feature to them and a little flavor profile. For us, it's all about creating flavor. Um, so the Marsal is going to be something to look forward to in 2021, I would say. Very, very good. There was also something I had at the Irish um, Whiskey Live in Dublin was the Amorone um, cask. That was wow. excellent. I love that. <laughs> right. So so this is, I, I, obviously, I like all of the whiskeys because I get, I get to have a, an influence in terms of the flavor profile. But this one, it's, it's now it's covering my face. It's a knockout. So this is my little go-to whiskey at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it is, it has the same style distillate, underlying distillate. So it, it has gone through the bourbon finish or a bourbon cask process along the way, 
but what it does is it that the amarone gives it a lovely sense of plum you get a sense of oak you get nutmeg you get cranberry you get all of these different styles of whiskey it's a real medium smooth body whiskey even though it's only a five-year-old whiskey so yeah you got the first we bottled 100 bottles of it for whiskey live last year and they literally walked out the door yeah so we we're, we're ready to go again. We were going to release it for St. Patrick's Day, but then obviously the crisis now has kind of deferred those plans, but it's ready to go. Um, and it is, so I'm the only person that really gets to, to enjoy that one for now. Will that be uh, available in Germany or is it just a Ireland only dis distribution? Well, we have, it's, what we want to do is, you know, we have, um, Marike Spritzer in Germany has taken on our brands and she has been a very strong advocate for us in Germany. So I, I think it would be unfair not to send some whiskey to, um, to Marike, considering that she has been a very strong supporter of the company from our inception. So you'll definitely find it in Germany. Um, it just it isn't an endless source for us. So it is a very it is a very limited release. All right. Yeah, that is the problem there. Very good. I just put in the uh, website here and connectwhiskey.com so we can take a, that, take a look at that. And Tina said, one walk to Germany with me from the Whiskey Live. <laughs> she actually right. brought home. I only brought home the sample. I did a video about it. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Fabulous. But, but I, I think the one thing that we've learned from it, and, and for me personally also, Jason, is that I think we have to go back to Amarone again because yeah. it just – those notes were absolutely fantastic. So if, if we're going to, if, you know, if we feel like we've created something that's exceptional, then I think we just have to go back to it and do it again. The problem is, as you know, is, is time is always something that we just can't accelerate. You just have to be patient and it will come again. Very, very good. I want to show one other spirit here. Um, this is a bottle that I have not yet seen. One second. Um, and you have to tell me the story behind this one here. Um, that's an interesting looking bottle and tell me a little bit about that logo as well if you'd like well yeah um, so so that is the mock-up bottle of our first release so that's connacht irish whiskey so this if you can oh. this is is connacht irish whiskey so this is i just pulled this from the cask this morning so you can see it is a um yeah so it is an Oloroso finished um, single malt. So it's gone through, um, in effect, three years of bourbon and it is going through another year of Oloroso. Now, you know, I, I often hear from people that, oh, you, you, fin you know, if you finish something or, you, you know, you're trying to mask that, you know, there might be a flaw in the distillate. Now, I am absolutely of the, I, I'm not of that opinion at all. When we set out on our journey, we had certain flavor tones that we wanted to, to adopt and integrate into. We, we chose the, the pale ale to be able to give us some fruit tones um, in, in our distillate, a little bit of green apple, a little bit of honey, a little bit of roasted almond. You put it in bourbon, you add a little bit of vanilla and butterscotch, as we know, and then you add the oloroso, and it gives it a bit of walnut, a little bit of caramel, a little bit of dried fruit. So this was the kind of a flavor profile. When we were doing our early blending at the beginning to say, okay, where's the sweet spot? So the oloroso finish is a very complementary aspect to the sweet spot. So when you, so that mock-up that you create, that you put out there, I think we're going to deviate that because that was the mock-up we created six years ago at this point in time so it's going to slightly change in terms of its appearance um the logo that you see and you can, can probably see that a little bit of the logo over our shoulder which is the company logo again that's if if you if you recognize on old maps um like from oh christopher columbus times where they always felt that you know the world was flat and if you sail too far you'd you'd sail over the end of the world you always saw dragons at the end of those particular maps. So, so the company logo, which was also in that mock-up, reflected the journey to the almost the end of the world and the voyage, right? So you can there you the, the voyage to 
other areas it was unchartered it was you know going a bit like star trek going where no man had ever gone before <laughs> in effect right so i can't say we're picard or anything like but that's where we wanted to do and that's where the logo both on the bottle and the logo of the company that's how all that comes together very good now tell me a little bit about the barrels where do you get your bourbon barrels from where do you get your sherry barrels from and will any other sure. barrels be in the process later on so so we have a motley crew we obviously have all also sher sherry barrels so we spent a long time um trying to identify a a very unique source for Oloroso, for Oloroso for us. So they come from a, an artisanal um, bodega, Fernando de, de Castilla. They make outstanding Oloroso sherries. We take our bourbon mills, our bourbon barrels obviously come from Kentucky, they come from Heaven Hills, but we specify that they are um, a four-year-old dump so that they're fresh and they're of a, a very specific skew. I won't name the skew within Heaven Hills, but, but we prescribe what those are. We have Marsala, we have Amarone, we have Sauterne, we have um, rum. So, so we're, we're looking at lots of different things. As I said, it's, it's all about flavor profile for us and creating some really, really interesting expressions. Um, we do have a, a double distillate, which we mentioned. We do have a triple distillate. The triple distillate is a lighter style for obvious reasons. It's slightly more fruity. So while one might, while the, the double distillate goes into Oloroso, we're looking at a different style for the triple distillate just because it has different attributes. So the, the cast to me is a very important um, component to complementing the underlying flavors of the distillate. So I think you have to look at lots of different options and lots of different expressions, you know, to keep us all interested, right? Isn't that yeah, important? Of course, everyone has a little bit of a different taste and it's very interesting about the renaissance here of Irish whiskey, all those different things that are now coming out. So this is an exciting time. I'm sure you'll be yeah, on Whiskey yeah. Life in Dublin if it happens, right? Well, we go, we go every year and, you know, you've, you've obviously, you, you interviewed Ella last year at it. I was afraid, so I was on the other <laughs> side of the camera. I don't like being asked hard, hard questions. Oh, yeah, you were the uh, guy that took a picture of me interviewing her. Yeah, I remember now, yeah. Through, through the hoop in the camera. Yeah, right? yeah, it's exactly. Really now I know that, right, right. <laughs> So, so we go there every year. It allows us to stay connected to people. People make the journey and we want, it might be the only time in the year that we get to chat and to talk and to talk about developments yeah. and that. So it's all, it's a great way for us to test, you know, Amarone being case in point. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure, that, you know, what did people feel? And, and yeah, you gave it a positive thumbs up. Everybody did. And that just endorsed what we did. So you want to make sure that you're creating something that everybody is going to enjoy. Whiskey Live is very, very important for that. Yeah. So um, Gockel asked, rum is lovely. What about, and he asked everyone in Ireland about those stout beer casks. He loves yeah, stout beer, Irish Finnish whiskey. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's something I'm interested in. Um, and, and it's very funny. I, I had a conversation with the guys down in Dick Max in Dingle um, with Peter and Finn and you know how they have their own brewery. So yeah, we were kind of saying, is there something that we might be able to do there with maybe a stout cask? Now what we have done is we've done a collaboration with the local brewery here where we created a whiskey finished ale. Now what we did was, so obviously we had our own cask finished with a a, a brown ale. We took that cask back and we've literally refinished it. Um, so we're putting more whiskey back into it to see exactly how that develops. But I, I'm with Thomas. I think there are certain things that we could do that the lovely collaborations that can be made, lovely flavor profiles that would be um, that, that we can create. So I'm, I'm really interested in those sort of things for the future. Very, very good. So if anyone has any other great questions like that, please ask them here. I think I skipped one person at the very beginning, if I may. Patrick um, Rickney says, well done, David, and the team at Connect. I don't know if you know Patrick or not. He's my first neighbor. <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah, I want to no do a little call out there. That was great. Now, do you have a visitor center? Can we actually normally visit you after these crazy times are over? The, the one just before we get into that, Jason, I do want to say thanks to Pat because when I came to the industry and I literally hadn't 
I had any idea about anything specific to regulations and rules and all of that sort of stuff. So Pat has been a great supporter and he has answered all my stupid questions and given me great guidance and great assistance. Um, he has fantastic, his, his, his um, drum shambo whiskey is an outstanding whiskey, his Irish whiskey, his pastel whiskey is fantastic. Obviously his gunpowder gin is, is international acclaim, so yeah. So Pat has been a very strong friend to me over the course of the last number of years, just to recognize that. Yeah. So your the, the, the question that you had for me? Yes, um, the question was visitor center. Can we actually come visit you after all this craziness is over? Oh yeah, um, now what we have, our visitor center is, it's, it's right on the property. So when you come into our reception, you enter into the visitor center. We do tours pretty much every day and um, it's, as you said, we're a little remote from everywhere. We're far, far away, um, but people do make the journey to us. And I think through time, as the number of distilleries in the region, Pat is developing his visitor center in Drumshambo. James is developing, you know, has a visitor center or, and, and will be developing greater infrastructure in Sleeve League. You have the guys in Loch Gill. You have Irish American in Mayo. So there's now, you know, I think there will be a, a hub of distilleries in the region that will, you know, create a, a better whiskey trail um, for people to come and enjoy. But we have a visitor center on site, um, and we're 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 very much a working distillery. So, and I know Tina has been was here um, last year. We bring you. So what you see behind me, we bring you into the environment. So you you smell it, you hear it, you see it, you see the distillers doing what they do each and every day, and, and I think that gives a sense of you know connectivity to the operation. We obviously have to finish it off with the tasting. It wouldn't be any fun otherwise, right? Um, so so we do all that on site. Um, everybody to come to the distillery and just yeah enjoy what it is to, to offer. Now, what I would say is that we don't do food or anything here. So it's just a visitor center. It's just a tour, you know, and we see ourselves as we want to complement all of the local businesses in the area rather than compete against them. So we've made that very specific choice um, so that we're, we're partners and we become, you know, a nice attribute to the local vicinity and a nice, you know, complement to the, to the tourism offering. All right, very good. Now, the good thing about internet and the bad thing is people come and go. So this question we yeah. asked before, but we can answer again. When do you plan to release your own bottlings? So we're in the middle of it right now. So the plan is to is to release it September, October timeframe. It will definitely, if, if, if Whiskey Live goes ahead, it will definitely be there. Um, but certainly what we want to do is try and take advantage of, you know, quarter four is a very strong season for for sales of whiskies and releases um, at the back of every year for the holiday season. So our intent is to be prepared for that. So subject to the crisis and everything just calming down and the world reverting back to, to some sense of normality, whatever that becomes, we intend to have the flagship released, the first batch of that released um, in Q4 of this year. Very, very good. David asked, how hard it is in, how hard is it in normal times to raise investment? And do you feel rural distillers are disadvantaged in this regard? Um, specific to the investment, the investment is always difficult. Um, the, the, the challenge for any distillery is that we make it today and we don't sell it until some point in time yeah. in the future. That could be four years, that could be 10 years, that could be longer. So what you have to do is, you, you know, your investment is going to have three particular phases. Firstly, you have to do, to build the infrastructure, put the, the equipment in place. Then you have the all the operational costs for utilities and people and payroll and, and insurances on all of that sort of stuff and grain and, and, and that. And then the third part of it is all the inventory that's set aside that you have to pay for now, but you can't, you know, you, you don't get the benefit of it until some point in the future. So every industry has to go through the same um, process. Um, of fun. Now, the question is the scale of it. How big is your distillery going to be? Are you a, a million LPA distillery? Are you a half a million LPA distillery? Or are you something lower than that? All of those is going to drive the amount of capital that you have to raise. I, I, I think 
the, the, if you're going to build something in a city, obviously the cost of real estate is going to be far more expensive. The licensing restrictions and the, the health and safety and, and, and all of those certifications are going to be far more restrictive. Traffic movements are going to be far more restrictive. So that's going to bring its own level of complexity that maybe a rural distillery won't have. Um, the cost of the development will obviously be cheaper in a rural capacity, but the, the corresponding side of it is specific to, to the visitor center. I know if you take Teeling's last year, they had something like 150,000 people come through their visitor center. I get five. So there is a function of how do you accrue revenue along the way to offset the investment. So depending on the scale of the project, depending on you know how big you want it to be, how much whiskey you want to make, and I suppose the one thing that I didn't mention is the sales and marketing costs to develop a new brand are very very significant. So how do you global bring all costs that? as well? Yeah, <laughs> global costs, Jason, absolutely, and, and that's not just a function. Even if we want to try and become established in Ireland you're still trying to go up and this is you know it's just this is marketing and sales you're a newbie you know lots of businesses have been at this for a very 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 long time have established those relationships and we're trying to break into that and that's a difficult thing to do so so the scale of investment is going to be a function of the size of the entity that you want to create I, I wouldn't see a huge difference between rural and urban as one is right and one is wrong. But I, I certainly think in the context of our story, we chose rural because you know it's it's maritime, it brings us all of these other things that are a function of our story and our belief in terms of the product and what it might be. Um, so you've lots of decisions to make along the way. All right, excellent, excellent. So your your um, audio quality is great. The visual, the video quality is a little bit lacking, but we're going to live with this for the next five minutes or so. Now, my last question is: um, thirty-one um, distilling, actually operational distilleries at the moment in Ireland, with maybe another ten to fifteen planned or in construction. When is the saturation point actually reached for Irish whiskey distilleries? Your opinion. My opinion, I think there is, sincerely, there is, there's 115, 120 distilleries in Scotland. So okay. we have 30. Specific to market share in a global capacity, like while we are growing year on year, again, it's off a very, very small base. What we're seeing is huge organic appetite by consumers for Irish whiskey. They're also seeing, they're becoming a little bit more sophisticated. They're looking for new flavor profiles. So, so specific to where we are, we have 31. We have four major um, distilleries, four or five. We have Tullamore with brands. We have Jameson. We have Bushmills. We have Beam. We have Great Northern coming through. We have Teeling. We have Bernard Walsh. We have Pat. So, so none of, you know, we, we have a small number of companies doing great things but i certainly think that the, the the inertia that's being created by those companies gives opportunity to the smaller guys um we have a classic phrase here where a, a rising tide carries all boats so we're all hoping and and i think we're seeing through the development of our government agencies agencies like board via that the sense of what Irish whiskey is, is becoming a more known thing, that I think there's greater education for the consumers. And all of those things are creating demands that the Irish distillers will hope to leverage and build on. So I, I don't see a saturation point at 30. I think there's plenty of room globally. And if you look at the trends of the marketplace trends, US is still growing year on year. Russia is, is really becoming you know, a strong heartland for Irish whiskey growth germany france australia south africa you know south american countries like brazil are becoming very very eager we haven't even touched into asia or I india say, china is, and so on come on india absolutely so so I, I i think i don't have any anxiety specific to the opportunity for irish whiskey but what i do worry is you know it, it it's not an easy path it's not a three-year get in and get out and you're done this is it's almost like a lifetime play you know you're at this it's going to i haven't we, you know we haven't even touched 
you know, really momentum in, in any meaningful way. And I'm still at this for eight years now. So, so you know, it, you have to be committed to the course. That's the most important thing as I see it. But I, I don't see saturation for Irish whiskey anytime soon. All right, very, very good. Now, the last question I always like, like to ask is, what did I forget to ask? What would you like to mention before we end this? Oh, what do <laughs> I don't even know what questions I've answered at this point in time now, to be honest, Jason. I, I think what we've had is we've had a very rounded conversation. I, I, I think specific to the people that have, have joined, I'm delighted that they have done because we don't have an opportunity to, to talk to people in a fashion like this. And maybe it's something that we should do a little bit more frequently. So I, I think people have asked some really nice questions that I've, I've tried to address. I, I think that the key thing for me and no doubt for the other distillers is, is, you know, when you go into a bar or when you go into an off license, you know, have a look around. There's some really, really good products out there. These are very difficult times for, for, for small distilleries like ourselves. So I would suggest, you know, our, our, our brand creation is always driven by on trade first. So bartenders, mixologists, tell consumers about our story and then the consumers can go and buy in the off licenses what it is that they've experienced. Now, ultimately, we're very on trade focused, but the on trade is shut down across the world. So what I would suggest, and it's not just for Connacht whiskey, but it's for independent distillers, wherever it is that you live, to give them a chance. Go pick up a bottle, bring it home, try it. Um, talk to your the, the, the guys that are in the stores, get their recommendations. Yeah, but have a think about the craft guys across the world. You know, they are hurting at the moment because their revenue streams have stopped and we're all trying to keep going. So that's a little bit of a challenge. Very good. Kevin says it was a great introduction here to connect. Well done, lads. Uh, great stream, folks. David said here, Susanna says, very interesting to listen. I'm excited about your first release. Looking forward to so, that. Me too, by the way. Very, very good. Yeah. All right. Good. So, David, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your passion for Irish whiskey, in particular your own. Um, I would like to thank everyone who's listened the entire time. Thank you very much. Whiskey Jason, whiskey from the viewpoint of American over here in Germany. All the best for the future and bye-bye.